Hi everyone, this is Sherry Epis again from Blackboard, and I'm your host of the weekly live session. And I want to be the first to welcome you to week two of the Designing an Exemplary Course MOOC. This week we'll be focusing on the interaction and collaboration section of the rubric. So first I'm going to go through a couple of reminders, and then we've got Jarl Jonas from our Course Sites team who's going to talk about the Hall of Fame idea. And then we're going to be hearing from Dr. David Graff from Nova Southeastern University. He's one of our exemplary dire uh, course directors, as well as one of the origi original founders of the exemplary course program. We also have Dr. Glaucio Scremen from Jacksonville State University and Dr. Becky Adams from the University of New Mexico, who are our two 2012 exemplary course winners. And so we're going to move on to reminders. Um, so if you're choosing to do the optional homework assignments, this is just a reminder to post your completed homework assignments um, in your group blog. You want to use that um, group discussion form to post reflections and comments on your discussion starters. And then based on a request, we've added a new discussion thread for you to post your reflections. Overall, I have to say that we are thrilled at the, uh, the level of participation so far. Um, I also want to give a quick shout out to our reviewers. Um, thank you so much to the reviewers who have been providing feedback dil diligently. And I also wanted to say next week we're going to be covering the assessment portion of the rubric. Um, and we did have a, um, just another announcement on groups that we've posted, that, um, created a few new groups based on um, popular demand. So if you haven't gone into the course recently, just go back in and there are new groups that you can join. Um, so at this point I was going to pass it over to Jarl, but it looks like he has not joined yet. Um, so I'll just speak about an idea that we have around the Hall of Fame. Um, to recognize your peers, um, we're going to create a new central course forum, and you can nominate one or more of your classmates. Um, there's going to be one thread per nomination, and include the name in your thread title, and describe how they have added to your enjoyment of the class or how they've helped you. And then everybody can view and rate the threads. So we'll se uh, send out some instructions to um, about this Hall of Fame. So you can recognize some of your peers who are really helping to make a difference. So with that, I am going to pass the torch over to Dr. David Graff. David? Thank you, Sharon. I uh, want to thank everyone for joining us today. And it's my pleasure to be with you today to lead this discussion about interaction and collaboration. Uh, just a very quick uh, overview of what we'll do today. Uh, you already know that it will be myself and uh, Glossio Scremen and Becky Adams uh, working with you today on this section of the rubric. But I want to spend a minute talking about course design. We can't have good interaction and collaboration in a course if the course isn't designed well from the start. So my point is that interaction and collaboration have to be built into the design of the course from day one. Uh, it's just very good basic instructional design. And I think that as we proceed, you'll see how, how important all that is. Um, we will, uh, as we proceed today, we're going to do things just a little bit different than uh, the, the, the folks from last week, uh, uh, what what uh, Maisie and Joan and uh, Geraldine did, uh, instead of jumping back and forth uh, as we talk about the various parts of this section of the rubric, I'm going to start by talking about one section, and then um, uh, Glossio will talk about another section, and Becky will end. We will have time at the end for questions, and we will be monitoring the questions that you pose in the chat. So 
uh, feel free to post them there also. So this is me. I work at Nova Southeastern University where I'm a, a director of many things. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I teach online. I have for many years. Uh, and as Sherilyn, uh, as Sharon uh, mentioned, uh, I'm one of the original collaborators along with Maisie from last week. Uh, responsible for the uh, exemplary course program uh, when it started with WebCT back in 2000. Um, that really doesn't mean much except that in the 12 or 13 years or so that I've been involved with this project, I've, I've had the opportunity to look at close to 700 courses. And uh, hopefully I've learned something about what, what a good course means. Uh, Dr. Scremen is from Jacksonville State University where he's an assistant professor in HPER and, sport man and, and the director of the sport management program. Uh, he will talk about his course and uh, show you why uh, uh, certain parts of his course uh, rose to the, the top, if you will, uh, jumped out at, at the reviewers and the directors last year. Uh, when we chose his course to be an exemplary course. That same is true of Becky. Dr. Adams is from the University of New Mexico, where she's the Associate Director of New Media and Extended Learning, and she's also a member of the Faculty in Organizational Learning and Instructional Technology. Uh, two very, very good uh, faculty members, uh, course designers, uh, in their own right, and I'll let them explain what they mean by that when, when we get to them. So let's talk about interaction and collaboration. I hope that you've taken the time to look at and review the exemplary course program rubric. You, there are several places in this course where you can download it. Um, and I think that um, it, it's worth it to have that in front of you as you progress either today or even next week. Uh, have it in front of you so you can pay attention to those elements in the rubric that uh, are being addressed. There are three pillars, if you will, in the interaction and collaboration section of the rubric. Communication strategies, development of a learning community, and interaction and logistics. I'm going to address the first one. Uh, Dr. Scremlin will look at the second. Dr. Adams will look at interaction and logistics. Uh, before we begin, I, I need to tell you that uh, this, is, this is kind of a, uh, how should I say it, um, this is one of the most important parts of the rubric as far as I am concerned. Uh, you, can, you can have a wonderful design of a course, but if you don't have good interaction, uh, I don't think it's a good course. Uh, that's just me. Uh, and it's the, the way I view online learning. Uh, it's a matter of building in all of the things we're going to talk about today. So communication strategies, well, what do we mean by that? Well, we can look at lots of ways, look at it lots of ways. We can look at things uh, from the standpoint of asynchronous activities, discussions, blogs, wikis. You've all been doing that uh, since you started this. Uh, I hope you continue to participate in the blogs and the discussions. Synchronous activities, chats, using Collaborate. Some of us use other th uh, third-party tools. Some of us may still be using Wimba or uh, uh, Illuminate. But these synchronous activities are also an important part of uh, interaction and collaboration in many, many courses. Student reflection, uh, journals. Uh, problem solving and so on. Uh, you might think, well, how is that part of communication? Well, to me, and you're going to see why I say this in a second, one part of communication and interaction in a course involves students interacting with their content. And, and so that's how that comes into play. And then to me and to all of the reviewers who review the nominations for the exemplary course program, uh, Instructor presence is important. Without instructor presence in, in, in a course, in, the, in those discussions, in those blogs, the wikis, uh, in the chats, uh, 
you've got you've got a lack, in my view, of what communication is all about. But I don't want you all to get the idea that interaction equals discussions. Interaction in online courses is much, much more than discussions or only discussions. Um, perhaps it would help if we looked at this little definition here. Uh, I created a course for our new uh, adjunct faculty here at Nova Southeastern University a while back. And as a part of that, I decided I needed the definition of interaction. And so I, I made this up. Uh, I'm sure you've seen some of this phraseology, because I didn't invite, invent this. This really came from uh, Moore several years ago. Interaction refers to the exchange of information and communication that occurs between a student and another student, between a student and the course content, and between the student and the instructor. If you have those three elements, you're well on your way to having interaction in a course. Here are some examples of how we can implement interaction within an online course. Uh, readings, certain web elements, having the students visit websites, blah, 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 even their own uh, library, online library. Certainly multimedia tools and objects, chats, groups activities that cause students to interact with each other, external resources, so on, and, and of course assignments. All of that comes into play with examples of rubrics. Well, all that's well and good, and we're going to talk now a little bit about how you apply the exemplary course program criteria related to interaction and collaboration in a real course. Uh, to do that, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Scrimmon, who will talk about the next elements in the rubric related to interaction and collaboration and how he implemented those in his course. So, yeah, thank you, David. All yours. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for attending our live session today. And in, in case you didn't really uh, get my name when Sharon and, and David, David mentioned my name a few times. I did a good job pronouncing it. I'll say it slowly. It's Glaucio. Um, so hopefully you got that this time. But I am, like David said, I was just, you know, he already introduced me, but I'm an assistant professor. Somebody was asking what's HPR. It's health, physical education, and recreation. My area is in, in sport management, but that's not in the name of the department. I am also the sport program or sport management program director, and I work at Jacksonville State University. Um, I've been teaching and developing online courses for the past five years or so, I was actually hired at Jacksonville State University to develop a fully online graduate program in sport management. And that's when I became involved in not only teaching online courses, but also developing an online curriculum and developing and designing online courses um, that are engaging and, and effective. And I think I've, I've come a long way, and I, I'm still, it's a work in progress, but uh, I'm proud of the work that, that we've done there at Jacksonville State University. So what I'd like to do is just to kind of, on my part at least, to briefly share with you some ideas and some examples on how to build and develop learning communities in online courses. And this is from the exemplary course rubric. Uh, these are some of the exemplary indicators, and, um, and specifically in terms of of the exemplary course rubric dealing with the development of learning communities. The goal is, of course, to build a sense of community among the students. And in order to do that, you really need to be mindful of designing a course that contains a variety of collaborative learning activities. And, and to piggyback on, you know, uh, on what David said, um, requiring student-to-student uh, -student interaction and student-to-instructor interaction. So let me advance that. Uh, generally, I, I like to, to frame this notion of a learning community in terms of this definition that I have here on this slide. And it's, it's advancing collective knowledge by supporting the growth of individual knowledge. That's how I, I think of a learning community, I think it makes, it makes a lot of sense, so hopefully it helps you too if you haven't heard uh, the idea or if you hadn't 
thought about the idea of, of a learning community. It's just, um, and I'll show you some examples of what I mean by that um, a little bit. Before I go on and give you some examples of some things that I do in my course, let me just spend some time here and talk about the, the course that I've, that I've developed. It's HPE 540. It's Sport Law and Ethics and Physical Education and Sport Management. This is an online graduate course required for students in the masters of both physical education and in sport management. And students in these programs, they're typically older, um, you know, 25 or older, but a lot of them are, um, you know, in their 30s, and then some of them are actually in their 40s. So they're coming in as adult learners into this program having something to share. So they do have something to bring into the into the course. They most of them are already employed and, and the reason why they're they can uh, uh, advance their their education is, you know, this is an online program. That would be the, the, the only way that they could uh, further their education that way. So it's um, for them I think you know, when I was designing this course I thought a lot about that and, and the fact that I could use their knowledge and their experiences in the course as opposed to teaching you know, a, a, an undergraduate or freshman course where it's typically just transfer of information. So, um, and just to kind of give you some, some idea where I'm coming from as far as my teaching philosophy is I, even before I became familiar with the, with the exemplary course uh, program, I, I I didn't know it was called a learning community, but I've always had this this philosophy of sharing knowledge, sharing information, and um, so it was it was really a good fit for me to to participate in this program and and, and to kind of have that as part of the of 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 the rubric and or one of the items that I had to um, to address and. What I do actually in this course is I have on my course syllabus a statement about the course philosophy dealing with learning communities. I give a brief explanation about what I mean by learning communities and, and that way I think students typically that's the first thing they see when they, they, uh, they log on to the course and they'll see right there on the first page this, this course philosophy and this idea of a learning community. And I have uh, on this slide here, I actually have part of the statement that I give to students. You know, the aim is to create a learning community where we can all share knowledge, ideas, and experiences, and thus learn from uh, from each other. So, with that, um, let me advance to the next slide here, and and share with you uh, one example. This is what you see here on your screen, this is uh, an icebreaker discussion forum that I do in the beginning of the course. I set this up as, as a discussion forum and I think it's important to start students thinking about this idea of a learning community from the beginning of the course. Uh, even though I've already introduced the concept in the syllabus, a lot of students don't really know what that means just from reading that, you know, that paragraph on the syllabus. So I I think it's important to ask them in the beginning of the course to, to see what they think a learning community is and, and that helps me as the instructor to, uh, to understand their expectations and, and it helps uh, the students buy into this idea of a learning community. Um, I do some other icebreaker activities but I think this particular one dealing with learning communities I think it's very important and I, I tell them specifically that I'll Know, read their answers and, and, and try to address their uh, expectations and their concerns the best way I can. And I think that really contributes to, to, to this whole idea of, of a learning community. So from the exemplary course rubric, that there are three exemplary indicators dealing with learning communities and the first two are here on this slide dealing with this idea of student-to-student -student interaction and student-to-instructor interaction. So what I want to do is to share with you what I require from my students in terms of their interaction with their, uh, with their peers and, and with me, the instructor. 
So what you're seeing here on this slide is a link to a discussion forum that I set up inside a weekly learning module. And here students are given some general instructions. And I, I understand that you can't probably read um, what's on the slide here. I don't mind sharing that with you later if, if, if you want to have a copy of this. But uh, just, just briefly here, I just wanted to give you the idea behind this, this discussion forum. Um, I have criteria for participation. There is a discussion forum rubric that I use that deals, well, there are three criteria in the rubric, but one deals specifically with the quality and amount of interaction that they have to, to, uh, to do with their peers. And they have to, one item is they have to respond to all of the questions or comments addressed directly to their, uh, to their initial discussion entries. They have to offer common or comments that are thoughtful, uh, meaningful. They have to ask questions. So they just have to interact with one another in a meaningful way. And I asked them to, to do this with more than, well, depending on the class. This class only had 23 students, but through, with at least two other students. That's, that would be the minimum in terms of, of their participation. I asked them, I, I set up these discussion forums for them for most of them at least, on a weekly basis. So I asked them to post their initial discussion entry by Thursday and to give time for everybody to go in and read those initial discussion entries. And then uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, uh, that's when they use that time to interact with one another. And that's, that's all explained in the syllabus. And I try to, to set that expectation uh, early in the course. Um, now, in terms of encouraging, I don't have actual requirements for student uh, for students to interact with me. I, you know, I moderate the discussions. I think David mentioned the importance of that earlier. I in, in the discussion forums, I provide at the end of the week a summative discussion post where I try to put things in perspective, highlight certain things, uh, certain comments, or certain points that uh, students made. And, and that's one way that, that I interact with them. But what I really wanted to share with you, it's something that I do in the beginning of the term. Um, I don't know how many of you have used Blackboard I Am as a tool comparable to the, or similar to the one that we're using here uh, to deliver this, this live session to you. And I use that. I ask students to download uh, the, the, the Blackboard I Am to their computers and schedule a time with me, hopefully in the first couple of weeks of the semester, to just to get to know me a little bit more so I can get to know them as well. And we can use chat, voice, video. Um, you know, I can take them on a web tour. I can present content. And it, it just makes for a more personable uh, experience. And, and I encourage them to, to meet with me several times during the semester. I use Blackboard I Am for virtual office hours. And that has been one thing that I've, that I've used. It's been very successful in, in uh, also building this, this sense of community um, among the students. And the students can use Blackboard I Am. They don't need me, the instructor, to be present so they can you know, interact with their, you know, with their peers uh, the same way. And I think that's been something that's been very, very useful for me. Uh, the third exemplary indicator it deals with this idea of uh, collaboration and, and designing collaboration activities that reinforce the course content um, you know, and get, or uh, stimulate teamwork cooperation. And this is, and I can spend a long time talking about this one slide here, but so I'll, I'll try to be, be brief and just kind of give you the cliff notes on on this idea of collaboration. Um, so this is a screenshot showing some of the collaboration learning activities that I use in my courses. I've grouped these activities into a section of the course, which I don't know if you can see it here. It's, which, of course, I label uh, collaboration. And uh, students receive a 30% of their final grade is from these collaboration learning activities. So starting with the blogs, uh, what I ask students to do is to find articles. Uh, it could be a video, or it could even be a personal story that relates to some aspect of the course. And, and then I ask them to blog about it. I require them to post at least five blogs 
during the semester and also comment on each other's blogs. I also provide them with a rubric to, to set the expectations about the quality of, uh, of these blogs. But what I generally ask them to do is provide a, a link to the story or a, to the article or video or if it's a story, uh, describe the story in the first couple of paragraphs, then link in the next you know, one or two paragraphs, link uh, that particular article or story with a specific aspect of the course, and then, you know, at the conclusion paragraph, just try to uh, describe to, to everybody in the course why you chose that specific article, how, how that relates to the course, and, you know, just, just give, give me, you know, your insight about why you chose that, that particular, uh, why you chose to blog about that particular article, video, or story. So they're not, the problem that I run into sometimes is students are just writing summaries of an article. That's, that's not what I want. A blog should be more about their, their own insights into, into that. Um, and, and the blogs, they do help develop this, the sense of a learning community and that students are bringing from the outside uh, from these different sources, and they're sharing knowledge, they're sharing their insights and experiences, and that really helps instill this, this sense of collect knowledge. And when you think about uh, the discussion forums, uh, typically that's done by an, an instructor uh, posing a topic to the students, so it's coming from the instructor, whereas with the blogs, the, the, the students are actually bringing that information from the outside and interacting with one another, collaborating. Uh, learning and, and, uh, and, and building that sense of collective knowledge in the process. With the reflection journals, I ask students to do one entry a week, and, and basically it's their takeaway from the previous week. So w what did they learn from uh, the readings, from the, these learning activities? What did they take away? It could be something positive. It could be something negative. Uh, again, I don't want them to regurgitate the information from the readings or uh, tell me what they think I want to hear. I want to hear from them what they've learned. Um, I have some, I'm not as strict in terms of uh, requirements for paragraphs or a number of words with the, with the reflection journals, uh, but I do you know, ask them to, to give me something meaningful more so than, well, I thought this week was very interesting or I thought, you know, the reading this week was very interesting because of A, B, and C. Um, and, and it's been, and that, well, the students can also look at each other's uh, reflection journals from week to week and, and just kind of learn from each other. Everybody, well, maybe not everybody, but typically the students have different insights into um, into their, their own learning experiences on a, on a weekly basis. So it really helps build that sense of community, um, you know, just by reading uh, each other's uh, reflections on uh, week by week. And the last one that I wanted to share here is, is the wiki. And you can use wiki in, in several different ways. And I use uh, a wiki in this course in, in many different ways. But what I wanted to share with you briefly here is, I, there is a uh, culminating assignment in this course that it's a risk management plan. It's a risk management plan. It's a very involved uh, assignment. It takes students um, two, three months to complete it. They do that in steps. So I get questions from students every semester about, well, can you offer, can you give us an example of an assignment from a student in a previous semester? Who did well, so we can use that as a template. And I think it's only fair that that they, you know, they that I do that. And I've done this for for the longest time. But uh, it turns out that I think that stifles creativity. So students are only shooting to do what the other student did. They're not plagiarizing or copying the assignment. But they're just not that if they didn't have that, they wouldn't do more. But I think that there, there, there was a better way to do that. So I've created a wiki where I anonymize a risk management plan from a student in a previous semester. I post that as a wiki assignment. So students throughout the semester have to go in and edit the document and make it better. They can ask me questions. I don't tell them what grade that student received for, for that assignment. And, and their project as a group is to make that better. So they'll They'll be working together uh, uh, to improve that risk management plan, and they'll be learning in the process how to do their own. 
So uh, uh, this has been kind of tricky in the past. It doesn't always work as well as I as I had hoped, but uh, especially this semester, the one that I'm doing for for a different class, but with the with the similar format, has been working very very well. So um, this is well, I do a lot more, but you know, for for time's sake here, I just want to uh, end here and you know give you time to ask me more specific questions if you have. At the end, I'll be happy to share any of the things that I showed you here, um, and then we can find a way to put that in the course. But let me go Actually, ahead and turn it over ask to, you, to back Sharon, to Sharon. Can we just ask a couple of questions that have come through in the yeah. chat window, just because it's related specifically to your topic? Yeah. So the first one yeah, was from absolutely. Paul earlier yeah. on. It's yeah. just curious why yeah. anonymity, anonymity is OK for an icebreaker. Well. That's not the only icebreaker that I use. You know, I do the personal introductions. I do a number of different icebreakers. For this one specifically, is there, there was an instance about two years ago where I was I, I knew the student personally, and and she told me that some of the other students weren't participating in that icebreaker or not giving honest answers because they were afraid that their their grades were going to be uh, uh, their grades were going to suffer if they said something negative. And, and I thought that my only interest in, in, in setting that discussion forum that way is to get feedback, to, to actually know their honest expectations about the course. And, and I thought if I gave them, only a few students in the past three years have, have uh, posted a, a, an entry that was anonymous. Most of them just don't mind. But I thought I would, I would at least give them the option of post an anonymous entry if they wanted to. That, that was my reasoning, at least. OK, great. Um, then there was another question about how you assign grades to these uh, collaborative activities. And do you use a rubric or providing any examples? Uh, I do provide examples. I do provide a rubric for the blog. For the wiki and the reflection journals, I, I give them feedback, weekly feedback, if they're uh, um, getting off track. And I, I don't grade, it's kind of, I grade them as sort of the, their body of work. I don't grade them for each individual blog. Uh, I, I tell them to address those, uh, you know, the, the, what I want them to address in the blogs and the reflection journals and the wikis. Uh, and if they don't, I give them some feedback. And, and if they don't address that, then their, their grade will, will, uh, will, uh, will suffer in the end. But, um, I, I don't know. It's it's worked well, at, at least with my students doing it that way. I, I've never. I, I thought about grading each blog individually, kind of like I do with the discussion forums, but for this one, I kind of grade them um, at the end of the semester. I kind of go back and look at some of the blogs that they wrote, and look at the participation in the wiki, and look at their journals, uh, and just kind of assign a grade based on that. Uh, that semester worth of of uh, collaboration, so to speak. Okay, thanks. One last question, and then we can move on to Becky. It's, this question is from Dana from Madison College. How open-ended should the assignment steps be? Should group students be responsible for organizing their own boards? Uh, I've well, I, I guess it depends. It, it depends on in my in my case here uh, with the discussion forums. There are some of them because this is a, it's a, a law and ethics course. We talk a lot about legal cases, so I have students argue in favor of a case, and a, another group of students argue against. So I do split them into groups, but um, and I've tried that with some of the wikis. And it's I don't know it's 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 with the discussion forum it's it's, it's worked well with the wikis it hasn't worked very well for me uh, and I just I, I don't really I can't really tell you why but um, I don't have any strong feelings that you should set it up uh, uh, well, I don't know I guess it depends on the number of students you have in the course in the summers I only have eight nine students so there isn't really depending on what you're doing, there isn't really much of a need to split students into groups. But I guess it depends on your, on your uh, specific situation. OK, great. Thanks. So we can pass it on to Dr. Becky Adams. 
Thank you, Sharon and uh, Glossio and David, and so nice to be here, everyone. Um, I'm coming from the University of New Mexico today, and um, I do teach a course for the um, College of Education Organizational Learning and Instructional T Technology Department. I'm also Associate Director of New Media and Extended Learning. We work with uh, faculty across the university to put their courses online. Um, I'm going to give you a peek into my grad course, but I, I have um, taught undergrad courses online as well, and I think they are equally as effective. Um, as you can imagine, and you guys already know, log logistics for interaction are critical to student success in an online environment. There are five exemplary indicators to measure that in the ECP rubric, and we will look at each one of these. Guidelines explaining required levels of participation, expectations uh, regarding the quality of communication, rubric or equivalent grading documents to help students understand how their participation is evaluated, um, instructor actively participating, and instructor using communication tools. My course is OLIT 535, The Theory and Practice of Distance Learning. And to give you just a sense of the course, um, interaction and collaboration are very critical elements of the OLIT 535 course. Having students work closely with the instructor and other students is an important part of the department's philosophy and objectives. The course is designed to be highly interactive and project-based. The students have an opportunity to learn the theories of distance learning through application, practice, and reflection as they work on an authentic distance education problem throughout the semester with both whole group and small group activities. The course focuses on the key factors affecting the learning process in an online environment. The readings, assignments, online activities, and application of theory are designed to give students an integrated view of the components of online learning in context. The course uses a scaffolding approach that allows students to apply their growing understanding to a complex scenario that builds as the semester progresses in an iterative process that allows students to continuously receive feedback from the instructor and their peers as their project develops. When the, first, when the students first enter the course, they are welcomed by a very short introductory video by the instructor, myself in this case. This is like the first few minutes of class and gives an introduction to the course, it sets expectations, and helps students know what to do next. The exemplary indicator from the rubric is helping students to know how to be successful in the course with guidelines of required levels of participation. Evaluators for my course pointed out that simple additions, such as a course schedule that was easy to find and was accessible all semester, was a supported part of assisting students with protocols and expectations. The schedule is synchronous sessions in both a quick look as well as a more detailed view. This schedule also noted the synchronous work that was going to be used during the semester. The course homepage also includes a reminder of when discussion posts are due. The schedule was set up so that the students must log into the course three times a week. This is to bring them into the course as well as to assist them in thinking on those days about the online course and reminding them to come in and check. Timing has worked around common days that online graduate students have available as well as time to read the readings and then post a response. Replies to the asynchronous discussion posts are due a few days later and all other assignments are due that same day throughout the semester for consistency, which in this case is Tuesdays. Assignments are due during technical support hours so that students can get assistance if they have problems. Explicit directions are included throughout the instruction and assignments both in text and on the sidebars as reminders. Evaluators noted that both group and individual work were interspersed throughout the course. 
both student to student and instructor instructor to student interaction was required, not just encouraged, they said. Expectations on communication was clear. Students were provided guidelines on how they were assessed and students were well prepared for the group work activities. The complex problem is a major assignment that is built on throughout the semester. Due to the weight of this assignment, a detailed document of instruction that is printable is included. Students work together both in asynchronous discussions as a group as well as asynchronous discussions with the class through a more traditional discussion of issues and ideas all together. Web conferencing tools are used for the student to student and instructor to student interaction as well. These were built in with support for student success. Activities were supported by directions, guidance, clear-cut expectations, and opportunities for practice. Students also used the web conferencing tool to meet with their groups throughout the semester in working on their group projects. I was surprised at how many times they voluntarily worked online inside the web conferencing session. Another means that we used to meet synchronously was using a virtual world. Class sessions were held there, as well as group discussions and presentations. This was used primarily to assist students to think about other options for synchronous meetings and what the benefits might be. In working with faculty across the university, I always mention that one key to an online course is that students need to know what to do and where to find it. It's just about that simple. Evaluators mentioned that expectations were clear, students were provided guidelines on how they were as assessed. The literature review is an example of this. Guidelines are given in text. And then demonstrations are given by guest experts via video so that students have a model of what is expected in the literature review. Rubrics are also used that give needed guidance to students of what is expected. This is for assignments as well as graded discussions. And finally, as stated in the ECP rubric, the instructor is active in the course using communication in areas already mentioned by David and Glossia. In my case, this is in discussions and podcasts, email, instruction through text and video demonstrations, web conferencing, office hours, private journals, announcements. I feel that feedback is especially important on assignments and activities since this is an opportunity to connect online. All our important instruction to instructor to student interaction that supports each of these areas for interaction have been covered today. They are communication strategies, development of a learning community, and interaction logistics. These areas are overlapping and supportive of each other so that students are supported in the online environment. So thank you very much for letting me share and I'll give this back to David. Uh, thank you, Becky. Uh, I, folks, thanks for uh, bearing with us uh, for the last 45 minutes. Uh, we have uh, time for questions and we certainly will address them. Feel free to um, uh, oh, Sharon, Sharon, I don't know how you want people to pose questions now. Um, still using the chat tool, is that right? Yeah, so continue to use the chat tool um, just because there are so many of us um, that everyone is muted except for the moderators. Um, if you have a specific question for a person, so whether it's be uh, Becky or David or Glaucio, please enter that into the chat window and I can help read them out and we'll answer them um, you know, over the Q&A here. And then um, I did save a couple of questions while Becky was speaking that were asked. 
um, that perhaps um, either one or the three of you could address. Would someone give some examples of measurable learning outcomes for wikis, blogs, and journals, et cetera? Well, th th this is Dave. Uh, th that's, a, that's a very basic instructional design question. And it really, uh, you, you really have to approach that question from the course design standpoint. Uh, other, there, I saw a couple of other questions about uh, well, how many, what, which tools are, are, are most effective? Do you have to use all the tools? Uh, you know, so on and so forth. And the answer is no. You, you use a tool when you have a purpose for doing so. Uh, I can tell you right now that the reviewers for the program and the, the directors, we, do, we don't look at a course and say, well, gosh, they didn't use blogs, so that can't be an exemplary course. No, no, no. We, we look at, okay, they used the blog tool. How did they use it? Was it done well? Uh, they used wikis. How did they use that? How, what did the students do in the wikis? Uh, what kind of feedback did they get uh, for their work in those wikis? And so on and so forth. So it's, it's the, the, the basic question is, uh, or the basic point is, use a tool only, only when you have a need to do it. And once you have a need to do it, then it's very easy to come up with an outcome. Uh, so. In my course, I, I, I teach a course in managing instructional technology and distance education programs. And I, in one part of the course, when we were still talking about IT, uh, we talk about uh, designing new classrooms. And I, I create a blog, and I post a resource in that blog, and I said, here, I, would, I just tell the students, this is a resource that addresses uh, the design of learning spaces for the 21st century. Your job is to add uh, at least two other references that you find. And, and then um, a brief description of why you think that that reference or resource is a good one. Well, it's very easy for me to evaluate that participation in that blog. David. See, was that you? Go ahead. Yeah, no, yeah. I was just going to make a quick comment. I, I, the reason I use all of those tools, I didn't have you know enough time to, to talk about it, but they do serve a specific purpose, and at least in my course, uh, with the blogs, the wikis, and the reflection journals, and uh, and and I, I agree with you 100%. A lot of people jump on the bandwagon. I, I when I first heard about the this Blackboard tool, the blogs, I thought they were the exact same thing as a discussion forum. And, and some people actually set up it that way. And, and, but you should, I like the idea of a, a backward, well, I'm not an instructional designer, but uh, of a backward uh, course design where you start with your learning objective, objectives and then you build your course around, you know, around those. And then you set up those learning activities to, uh, to meet those uh, learning goals, so um, I, don't know, I just thought I would I would comment on it, and then specifically in my course, they, they each one of those activities do serve a purpose. I would really like to support that, and thank you, David and Glacio, for your comments. Um, I've taught this course a good long while, and each tool has somewhat evolved, uh, but there is a certain um, objective that we're meeting when we use each different tool. So uh, we, we try very hard not to use tools just for the tool's sake. Yeah, this is Dave. Let me address the question that just popped up here from uh, Lynette. How do you use discussions in a course of 700 students? Uh, I've never had to teach a course that, that large. Uh, um, and and I, would, I would think that a course that large is, is a, a MOOC like this one or evolving into one like this course. Uh, but if it's 700 students, it more than likely is a blended course. I'll just make that assumption. And there are different ways or purposes that you would use uh, discussions in, in blended courses. So I, I, don't, I don't even think that that question is, is a good one uh, in terms of our being able to answer that here. It depends on the purpose of the course. and the uh, whether or not the course really needs to have discussions. If 
I may, I, I'd like to jump in on that as well. We have courses that are um, not 700. We haven't gone as high as 700, but we do have courses that are 125 to 300. And, and if they are truly online courses, we are expecting interaction. And so there is a dedication from the department to add TAs to be able to handle a, a smaller group of, of students. Um, I have also heard of people having students be made leaders and then do um, some reporting out on that. But we, we also agree that it needs to have uh, interaction even if you have a large class. It needs to be appropriate interaction. Um, okay, so there was a question from Tori Bond um, earlier, I think, while you were speaking, Becky. How did you build the interactive elements of an authentic distance education problem that students would work on throughout the semester? Hi, Tori. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I hope I am understanding it all right. What we what we actually did was we give them real world problems. We asked them to sign up for those. We have experts that we have them interview, and then as the we ha divide the course into elements that they need to learn, uh, such as student, uh, who are your students, and what do your faculty need to. Um, learn how to do and media and then the students build a recommendation to their expert regarding what their distance problem is um, working in a small group. So it develops along the course of the semester and uh, by the end of the semester they have an executive summary, a presentation to give the, um, the expert and um, a solution based on what we've taught them. So Tori wants to know what interactive tool did you use? Uh, well, we used a lot of tools. Um, the probably interactive uh, is a is defined differently in different folks' minds. Um, we we used um, they pr they produced um, Camtasia videos. They um, used the videos to learn how to do certain things, such as their lit review. Uh, we also met in Second Life, as you guys saw, in the virtual world. And the students were given tasks to do, including uh, at one, one semester we had them do a um, scavenger hunt <coughs> to find things. Um, we also used web conferencing. And then asynchronously, we used the discussion board um, in various ways, including discussions, group discussions, and also for assignments with interaction so that they could get feedback from each other. I hope that answered the question. Uh, Sharon, this is Dave. I wonder if I could interject. Uh, there are two things that, that I made notes on that I really want to address before we sign off. One is related to uh, something that was uh, really discussed or brought up last week, and I think here again a little bit during the chats. Um, I need to make it very clear that the exemplary course program rubric does not really differentiate between courses designed by what I term Lone Rangers, you, the individual faculty member, and those courses designed by a team of, of uh, folks, including it might be videographers, uh, course designers, uh, graphic artists, whatever. Uh, and I can tell you that over the 12 years or so that I've been involved with this project, we've had a mix of both. So there's, there's no magic formula that says, because this course was designed by a team, it's going to be a, an exemplary course. Uh, uh, so I wanted to make that distinction. I think that's very important. Uh, related to that, there was also a point in here about, well, maybe this stuff is only uh, or is better for graduate level courses. No, not really. We've had. Uh, and the rubric doesn't even uh, approach that element uh, of, of, of grade level, if you will. We ask you what the grade level is, but so what? We've had winning courses from uh, public schools, 
community colleges, colleges and universities, uh, private uh, entities, corporate. Uh, we've had, had courses that are really not credit courses, professional development types of things where uh, an institution might be uh, providing training for their faculty on, on uh, let's say, online teaching. Uh, so it really, uh, really is interesting how all of that evolves. And the rubric is, is I would say, very, um, what's the term I'm looking for? The rubric is, uh, doesn't, doesn't address that specifically, any of those elements. And then finally, the, other, the last point I want to make, unrelated to the previous two, is uh, why you might be interested in nominating a course for the exemplary course program. Uh, certainly not every course that is nominated is selected as a winning course or as an exemplary course, but really I wonder if that really is why you would be interested in submitting. You should be interested in submitting your course for the feedback you will get. Uh, the courses that are submitted for this program are reviewed by at least three separate reviewers and then those that rise to the top from the ranks of the reviewers are also reviewed by the directors uh, at another level and we make the decisions then. So the, the feedback you get uh, can be very, very helpful and I will say finally that many of the courses, I shouldn't say many, several of the courses uh, that have been uh, chosen in recent years are courses that were submitted, were not selected, uh, the individuals involved went back, looked at the feedback, changed their courses, resubmitted, and then we, then we selected them. So, uh, uh, Sharon, you might want to talk a little bit about the program and when the, the program opens and what the process is. Sure, I'll address it more in week four, but I'll touch on it now as well. So the 2013 Exemplary Course Program will start on uh, December 1st. That's when the window submission will open, um, and it'll close sometime towards the end of February. So you have just about three months to, to submit your courses. Um, and so when, uh, come December 1st, the website will be live and we'll be sending out lots of email announcements um, when that submission window will be open. And um, we'll be, you know, contacting many of you to s sign up to be reviewers again and, um, and so forth. There's a question about uh, blended courses. Yes. If you look at the, the rubric, the nomination form, not the rubric, the nomination form very carefully, uh, if you're submitting a course that is a blended course or a hybrid, whatever you want to call it, uh, the rubric asks that you let us know that, you tell us that specifically, and then for each section of the rubric, each of the four sections, you are asked to identify how the elements in, or the criteria statements in that part of the rubric are addressed in your course. So for example, in a blended course, maybe discussions is not so relevant as is some of the content presentation. Uh, but it could be just the opposite also. So those are the kinds of things that we look at when we get a blended course. Uh, please don't hesitate to submit a blended course. I just see some questions again about the site to review exemplary courses. So the website, and I can put it, uh, Lauren has already posted the sign up form. So if you're interested, you know, when the submission window opens on December 1, um, you can fill out that information and we'll make sure you get that information. But um, the website is www.blackboard.com slash catalyst and you can select the exemplary course tab. Right now there's, you know, very little information um, until the submission window opens. But you can see a sample submission form um, that's in Word. We do now have a new online submission form. Uh, it's very similar, it just looks different because it's an online version rather than in Word.
and yes, Lauren just posted the link. So if you want to see the exemplary course tours, um, most of our winners su um, supplied us with course tours um, that have been posted to the website as well. So you can see all the winners tours there. Um, okay, we'll stay on for a few more minutes here. If you have more questions, um, please continue to post them to the chat window. So there's a question about um, how do we see if we've won a badge. Um, so badge, badges will only be made available at the end of the four weeks. Um, so you'll have to wait until the, the badges are released. Kevin asks a question about, does anyone use tools and combinations, i.e. a wiki and a blog? Does anyone ad address that question? Boy, I don't use, uh, I use both discussions and a blog in my course, but that's it. And then that one, the, the blog is only used for that one uh, a uh, resource to gather an assignment. The rest of the time in my course, it's uh, the, the, the discussion tool is my main communication tool because much of this course is about sharing experiences as a manager. I have used a wiki for groups to work together and work out things, and then the, the discussion would be more of a, um, of a coming together and, and replying perhaps more for the assignment piece. Well, oh, and then I, I use Lots of things. I use wiki, I use discussions, I use uh, blogs, and I, I haven't had a chance to talk about a, a peer review uh, assignment that I, I ask students to to, um, to do. And, and But again, each one of those learning activities does have a specific purpose, and, and hopefully I'm not using them just uh, for the sake of using a tool because, you know, uh, It does have a learning uh, purpose behind it. And so someone has, uh, Robert McCunney asked, has anyone di dismissed the discussion boards entirely and replaced them with a wiki or blog? Uh, this is Dave. We have a faculty member here who's done it. I've not. Uh, but this faculty member teaches a course on uh, uh, integrating Web 2.0 tools in online courses. So it's an appropriate way of uh, go doing away with discussions and going back to uh, blogs and wikis, which are a little bit more Web 2.0 based. That's my experience as well. I have a faculty who has has moved to a wiki, uh, but more fit fit her content and her style as well. Sharon, I wonder if if, uh, if if you're not finding any other questions, we might end this today by revisiting uh, something that uh, Maisie's uh, folks last week talked about. 
uh, and that is simply this. Uh, I would ask uh, Glaucio and uh, Becky to address the following question. What has winning, uh, has the winning of uh, your course as an exemplary course meant to you on your campus, personally, professionally? What has it meant? Glaucio? Okay, well, I guess I, I was waiting for Becky to jump in. I guess I'll go first. But uh, let me just make a comment before I, I answer your question, David. And, and, I, and now I think I remember, you're the one who called me when I, when I received the award. And I think I, I said to you over the phone that, well, I'm the, I'm the example that you gave when you're making a comment about the, you know, people should really participate in this program for the feedback. And that's what happened to me. I submitted this course in the first year. Uh, for the feedback, and I received great feedback from the reviewers. Went back, made some changes, made the course better, submitted the following year, and and then won the award the following year. So, I would just vouch for that, you know, anytime because it's it, I did it to get the feedback to to make the course better. This is uh, uh, it's free, you know. It, well, the, the reviewers are experts in course design. I am a faculty member. I have no formal training in instructional design. I, I had to teach myself. I had a lot of help from our business education uh, folks at, at Jacksonville State University, but um, and it was extremely helpful to me. So after I won the award, I don't know. I guess it's just been. I, I feel grateful that you know it, the, the, all that work that I put in uh, was recognized, and and you know it just it tells me that I, I'm I'm going in the right direction. It, it's still a work in progress. I still struggle. Um, trying to, to do things better and then trying to, to meet my students uh, learning needs um, the, the best way I can but I think that what I took away from this experience not only from winning it but from participating in the program was was the feedback and then and then uh, and how to make the course better and even I got lots of constructive criticisms this past year when I won and I still have Lots of things that I want to do to improve uh, uh, my course. So that's what I took away from it. Becky, how about you? Well, um, Glossy, you've done an awesome job. I, I love that you you keep saying that you're just learning. Uh, my my situation was very similar. I I kind of put my course in the um, the Hopper at the last minute hadn't thought a whole lot about it, but this is my career is working with other faculty. So one of the things that did for me was give me some reinforcement that yes, we do know what we're doing, and the feedback that I was getting was very helpful in knowing that the things that we did well are considered that across the board, even though we're reading the literature all the time. Uh, we got some very positive attention. Our our. Uh, university is still struggling with our online courses real and so having the award helped us um, get a little attention in that direction but primarily it was the great feedback these these um, reviewers are are wonderful the feedback they gave were very helpful and um, Glossio said so well it, it's always a work in progress we're all learning every semester we teach um, so it, it's been an awesome experience, and hanging out with all the other winners and being able to do um, uh, the MOOC has been a, a real pleasure as well. Well, I think we could probably wrap up at this point. Um, I just see lots of great comments and discussion in the chat, but no specific questions. Um, we will post a recording of today's session in the course, um, as well as a copy of the chat uh, in the course. And I want to thank David and Becky and Glacio for a fantastic presentation and discussion today. I really appreciate you taking the time and share your experience with everyone and your knowledge and your advice. Um, it is much appreciated by, I think, everyone here. You can see the great positive comments in the chat, um, and as well as us here at Blackboard. Um, so with that, if there's any further questions, feel free to post them in the Q&A forum in the course itself, and we will continue to answer them there. 
until next week. So thanks again, everyone. Bye-bye.